Um, so I'm pleased uh, to have you all here today and do excuse me, welcome Dr. Rebecca Semph as our guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Semph is the chief curator at the Center for Creative Photography at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, Becky, as she's known by most in the field, is an Ansel Adams scholar and her recent publication, Making a Photographer, the early work of Ansel Adams is the subject of today's talk. Prior to her position at the Center for Creative Photography, Becky earned a BA in art history from the University of Arizona and completed her MA and PhD at Boston University. In 2012, her book, Reconstructing the View, the Grand Canyon photographs of Mark Klett and Byron Wolfe was released by the University of California Press. And in 2017, her book, To Be 13, showcasing the work of Betsy Schneider was published by Radius Books and the Phoenix Art Museum. You can also learn more about Becky on her website, RebeccaSempf.com. Um, we're in for a treat with Becky leading this talk today. Ansel Adams' career is one that's well known and documented, but after I personally read her book, I was struck by the similarities of this part of Ansel's life and the world that we're navigating today. Um, at, at the time that the book focuses on, this is in the 20s and 30s, um, Ansel was a relatively unknown commercial photographer who was very much navigating a brand new career. He was also developing that career during the Great Depression, the global crisis of his time, and would soon begin making what we know today as his masterworks while the world was struggling to make it day to day. Added to that was the onset of World War II and America's role in that war when Adams would continue to operate at the highest level of his creative output. Uh, during today's talk, we encourage you to submit questions using the chat feature, which we'll answer after the talk is complete. So for now, I'm pleased to welcome Becky Semph. Thank you, Scott. Thanks so much for the invitation and thank you to the Medium board members for uh, including this talk as part of the Medium Summit. I'm gonna share my screen. Are we seeing it? We are. Terrific. <coughs> Excuse me. So as Scott said, today I'm gonna talk about my new book, uh, Making a Photographer, the Early Work of Ansel Adams. And I'm gonna focus particularly on his commercial work of the late 20s and 30s done for the Yosemite Park and Curry Company, which in my argument about Adams and his uh, sort of mature style work is really pivotal. Um, I'm also gonna add a little detour to this talk. This is a, a special shout out for Michael Dawson who's attended a bunch of my Ansel Adams talks. And so there's always gotta be something new for him. Um, but I, I want to um, put in some information about Adams as an advocate for photography, because I think for those of us who are participating in the Medium Summit this week, that idea might be germane and relevant to our conversations. So to begin with, this is the cover of my book, Making a Photographer, the Early Work of Ansel Adams. I began research on this project in 2003 when I was working as a research assistant at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and working on my doctoral dissertation at Boston University. I was hired to be part of a big Ansel Adams exhibition uh, that the MFA did from the Lane Collection. And so my research began then. It continued as a doctoral student and then over the last three years, I began reworking it for publication as a book, which happened this February with Yale University Press and the Center for Creative Photography. My focus in the book is on Adams's early work and the primary question that I was interested in investigating was how did he go from making pictures like the one we're seeing on the left, uh, a small, low contrast, focused picture of a stand of trees in Yosemite Valley to making pictures like the one on the right. Um, the one on the right is from 1958. The one on the left is from about 1920. So on the right, we see one of Adams's iconic views of Aspens in Northern New Mexico. We see that dramatic contrast, the use of light, um, and it creates for many viewers, a more emotional experience of the scene than the more subtle one we see on the left. 
So the question was, how does he go from pictures like the one on, on the left to pictures like the one on the right? So to begin with, I wanna talk a little bit about Adams's mature style, signature style. And interestingly, as I began to work on the book, I realized that nobody had ever really defined what makes an Ansel Adams look like an Ansel Adams. So that was one of the first tasks with the book was to describe what characteristics that includes. So I was interested in thinking about how his work heroizes the landscape and his intention to use photography to emotionally engage his viewers to think about the redemptive possibility of the landscape and of wilderness places and even of nature more generally. And so what characteristics does he use to get there? Well, one of them is a panoramic sweep of landscape so that we see the whole thing. Another is an omniscient viewpoint. So a godlike view so that we believe we're seeing the most important or the best view of the scene. He uses light and weather effects in order to create a sense of drop, drama and awe. And then finally, there's the zone system, that use of a broad range of whites all the way to blacks and all the grays in between, pretty well balanced across that spectrum to create this overall zone system look. And so I'm gonna talk now, uh, or read rather, a passage from the book about this photograph, the Tetons and the Snake River, that goes into a little more specific detail about how those characteristics play out. So, using the Tetons and the Snake River as an example, it is possible to describe these stylistic elements that Adams brought together to support his communicative goal. This photograph visually expresses the transformative potential of experiences in nature and the value of wilderness as an intrinsic good. In sum, it presents a heroic vision of the American wilderness as an invaluable asset to its citizens. Adams chose a vantage point that facilitated a panoramic view of the Teton mountain range with the winding Snake River. The picture includes a swath of cloud-filled sky and distant mountains with patches of bright snow. In the mid-range, the Silvery River curves through tree-covered banks. With little immediate foreground, Adams created a perspective that suggests his omniscient grasp of the scene, and as such implies that what is presented is made from the ideal position and is the best, or perhaps the only, way this particular vista should be seen. It is a stylistic choice that imparts authority and gravity to the picture and, and confers importance on its subject. Adams favored landscape views that featured visible weather, such as snowstorms, billowing clouds, and rain. In some instances, his photographs include a wide band of sky to accommodate clouds, emphasizing an atmospheric expanse. In other cases, clouds and mist appear around landforms, creating depth within the three-dimensional space and helping to define and shape the appearance of the land itself as with this image, for instance, of clearing winter storm. One advantage of weather for Adams was its ephemeral nature. Clouds, rain, and snow are all temporal elements and they impart a sense of transience and motion to Adams's necessarily still frames. In the Tetons and the Snake River, the sky glows behind dark storm clouds and the left-hand portion of the mountains is bathed in sunlight as is the surface of Snake River, causing it to shimmer within the darker surrounding territory. Because of the changeability of the light and weather depicted, the viewer is aware that the scene Adams captured must not have looked like this for long, and indeed will never look exactly like this again. Thus the viewer can both appreciate the magical qualities of spectacular clouds and illuminating rays as inspiring features of the natural world, and also attribute to Adams the ability to perceive and record just the right moment when the scene offered this exquisite combination of visual effects. A key component of Adams's mature style is an operatic treatment of his subject, a desire to heighten the dramatic qualities of the scene and create a photographic work of art that is both widely comprehensible and spectacular. 
In some instances, it is achieved by his use of viewpoint. At other times, it is light or weather effects that convey that engaging sense of drama. In some pictures, such as the Tetons and the Snake River, it is the use of powerful shifts in contrast, glittering passages of light interspersed with or appearing alongside areas of dense shadow or darkness. Adams's use of heightened contrast gives his images an engaging forcefulness, making his artworks bold and serious. The perception that the landscape is imbued with drama creates an expectation that the situation is not static and that viewers are observing a fleeting moment within an evolving situation. Adams's use of operatic and awe-inspiring qualities in his prints plays upon the expectations of viewers. The Tetons and the Snake River as a work of photographic art is impactful because the actual scene when observed by a typical National Park tourist does not look as it does in Adams's picture. His complete set of skills in making the negative and the print coalesce to create an artwork that surpasses people's real life experience, presenting an idealized heroic version of what really exists but one still rooted in the appearance of the scene. In so doing, Adam's artworks convey not what he saw, but what he felt. Perhaps more importantly, they convey what Adams hoped his viewers would feel when faced with these landscapes that were deeply meaningful and inspiring to him. So that introduces this idea of Adams's signature style. Now the book begins back in 1916 when Adams was a 14 year old kid who goes with his family to Yosemite National Park for summer vacation. Adams is an only child and he had read about Yosemite in Hutchings book, 19th century account of Yosemite Valley and persuaded his parents that they should vacation there. And at the Center for Creative Photography, we have this childhood album of Adams's pictures from that very first trip to Yosemite. You can see here, they're just small uh, snapshots really that were developed in the lab in Yosemite Valley. They're just glossy, small prints. And technically Adams has not achieved very much mastery here. He's working with a box brownie camera, a very rudimentary type of camera. So he doesn't have a lot of control. But what I like about the album are two things. One, we see him organizing it around the different geographical landmarks in Yosemite, so by um, geography rather than chronologically or some other way. So we can see him being very thoughtful about the presentation of the photographs, so perhaps beginning to think about how they will be experienced. We also see him experimenting with his framing, with his lighting, with his um, viewpoint. So for instance, there are two pages of half dome pictures. We're seeing one of them here. And you can see that he's playing around with where to place half dome within the frame. He's using backlighting in one picture. Sometimes half dome appears at the far right edge. Sometimes it appears at the left, sometimes at the bottom corner, sometimes at the top. So we can see him as a young man already thinking about what it means to compose a photograph. This is a really great starting place for the story because he's just a kid, he's just learning photography, and he initially experiences the wilderness very much as a tourist, but that's going to rapidly change. So the next chapter of the book looks at Ansel Adams's Parmelian Prince, which was a, a product that he produced for sale in 1927 with the support of a donor, Albert Bender, who underwrote the production and helped Adams find clients for the work. It include, included 18 pictures. Uh, this one, Kearsarge Pinnacles, was one of them. And they were all mountain pictures from Yosemite, the high country, and Kings Canyon area in California. And this was the work he'd been doing for himself personally. He didn't <clears throat> yet have a good idea of what kind of audience he was making pictures for. So this is his professional starting point. Over the period between 1916, when he first comes to Yosemite, and this moment in the mid-1920s, he's become quite an avid mountaineer and very accomplished, both technically in photography, as we can see from this photograph, and 
as an outdoorsman. So he's learned a lot about uh, climbing and backpacking and ornithology and zoology and botany and geology so that he really knows this mountain area very well. And this picture monolith, the face of Half Dome, one of his earliest iconic images was made as part of this portfolio. <clears throat> And just to show you what the physical objects look like, here's that Kearsarge Pinnacles picture. And you can see the translucent paper. You can literally see right through it. They were in folders in a portfolio along with the colophon that we see on the right. And so these were meant to be handled and arranged and rearranged and viewed in close proximity in a very intimate way. <clears throat> Next, Adams, the next chapter of the book looks at Adams's work for the Sierra Club. This was a really influential period of his, his work. He is making pictures of the summer outing, which is a four week trip that about 200 Sierra Club members would go on together. And Adams created an album of the trip, the official album, that allowed trip members to select pictures from the trip that they could then ask Adams to print for them. And so this allowed me in the course of the book to talk about how now Adams is making pictures for an audience that he actually knows very well. These are his fellow Sierra Club members. And so he's thinking about what kinds of pictures are the club members going to be interested in and how does he produce work that will then allow him to sell prints to his, his fellow outing participants. The next chapter of the book looks at Taos Pueblo. This is a publication Adams did with the writer and Indian activist Mary Austin. He joined Albert Bender to northern New Mexico in the late 1920s and was really inspired by the landscape there, by the uh, what he felt were exotic cultures of American Indians and uh, Hispanic population. And so he wanted to find some way to create a commercial product out of this experience. He visited Northern New Mexico a number of times and ultimately he and Mary Austin settle on photographing the Taos Pueblo. Adams makes 12 pictures Mary Austin writes an essay. And then what's significant about this project for my argument is that Adams was a member of a number of book collecting clubs in the Bay Area. And it was through his knowledge of the other book collectors that he came to the idea of bringing the work that he'd made at Taos together into a very high-end publication. It's large scale. It's letterpress type with uh, these design, beautiful design elements and colored ink, a special leather and linen cover to the book. But the key aspect was that Adams had William Dassonville, one of his colleagues in the Bay Area, photographer and very famous paper maker, uh, coat the paper for the book, the same paper that they used for the essay with photographic emulsion which allowed Adams to print these gelatin silver prints directly on the paper that would be bound into the book. So it was more typical in this era to either use photomechanical reproductions or to tip photographs in. And Adams had this idea that if they could create a book that technically was, was made in a different way, a very unique and special way, that might make the book more attractive to book collectors. <clears throat> and as it turns out, he was right. He managed to sell out a very expensive $75 book. It's the equivalent of something like $1,100 in today's dollars in 1930, which is the early years of the Great Depression. So he is on to something in his thinking about how audiences approach purchases. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So the next chapter of the book focuses on Adams's work <clears throat> for the Yosemite Park and Curry Company. And the reason that this is such an important aspect of my study is that Adams always acknowledged the important role of commercial work in his career but particularly from the perspective that it allowed him to earn money 
when his artwork wasn't necessarily earning money, and that he enjoyed those what he called assignments from without. And truthfully, having researched Adams, he actually really invested quite a bit of his energy into commercial assignments. It always mattered to him that he brought his best work, no matter who the client was. But for my study, what was interesting is watching him at the Yosemite Park and Curry Company and the way that this particular commercial job impacted his style and really was critical in that transformation from those earlier 1920s, low contrast, intimate, um, much more subtle pictures to the works that we think of as classic or iconic Ansel Adams pictures. So for instance, Adams made this photograph of that ice skating rink below Half Dome for Yosemite Park and Curry Company. The YPCCO, as the Yosemite Park and Curry Company was known, was the major concession in the park. They were responsible for all the lodging, all the restaurants, all the provisioning, if you were gonna go into the high country, but they also had a whole range of activities that you could participate in and so, for instance, if you wanted to skate at the skating rink, you were paying money to the YPCCO. So they hired Ansel Adams to photograph particularly the winter sports, because if you think about supply and demand, if you're Yosemite Park and Curry Company and you have a certain number of beds, certain number of rooms to rent, and they're all sold out in the summer, having more tourists come in the summer doesn't do you much good. What you want is to fill that same number of rooms in the winter time when you're not at capacity. So they hired Adams to make pictures. In particular, in my book, I focus on this publication, Four Seasons in Yosemite National Park, that Adams, uh, Adams's photographs appear in. This was a souvenir tourist publication created by the marketing department of Yosemite Park and Curry Company that brought together Adams's pictures with very perky uh, promotional text about all the different things that you could do during a Yosemite vacation. It's organized around the four seasons with this idea that summer visitors would see the things that they participated in, but also be introduced to things that they could come back to see in Yosemite in the fall or in the winter. And so here we see Adams's golfing picture demonstrating one of the, the particular possibilities. But Adams in his role for the Yosemite Park and Curry Company reported directly to the marketing department. So he was getting shooting scripts from them. He was receiving instruction about what kinds of pictures they wanted and even receiving instruction about how to compose and create pictures that had both the narrative uh, impact and the kind of emotional pull that YPCCO needed in order to get tourists to actually come to Yosemite in let's say the winter season. So for instance, Adams worked on things like this. This is a window display in a, I suspect, San Francisco department store where they have clothing and gear on sale, but in the background are Ansel Adams's pictures showing the setting and activities that somebody could partake in if they came to Yosemite for a winter vacation. Uh, Adams's work also appeared on the cover of the Awani dining room menus. So here we're seeing, I have the date, uh, May 10th, 1936 breakfast menu. For each meal in the Awani dining room, there was a new set of menus printed and they were souvenir items. You could get an envelope from the maitre d' to keep your souvenir menu that had an Ansel Adams image on the cover. These are kind of fun. You can still buy these on eBay for a reasonable amount of money. And it's, it's fun to see the kinds of things that in 1936 they were having for breakfast, like chicken liver saute with bacon on toast and stewed rhubarb and raisin muffins. But I also want to call attention to the way that Adams is allowing his work to be reproduced. Uh, many of you probably know that Adams was a real stickler for reproduction quality and his work early in the 20th century actually significantly impacted the quality of photographic reproduction in print. 
He expected very high quality and worked with printers to get a kind of subtlety in printing that was not typical of the era. And to give you a sense of just how degraded the reproduction of the image on the menu is, I'm comparing here an image of a fine print of Mount Galen Clark on the left with the image on the menu on the right. You can even see the, the dot matrix in the printing, but I'm sure you can appreciate the kind of subtlety that is in areas of the sky, for instance, or in the face of the mountain that have been lost in the reproduction. But I think Adams really liked and valued having his pictures as part of the Awani experience and continued to make images for Awani menus for decades. This was not a passing practice. His work was also used by the Yosemite Park and Curry Company. Uh, it was released with press releases. So for instance, this is the San Francisco Chronicle, July 3rd, 1932. It's a full page spread about waterfalls in Yosemite, all of the pictures by Ansel Adams. So they would have sent out Adams's images along with a news flash about the, the snows that winter and resulting in these high levels of waterfalls. And so Adams's pictures would have appeared in newspapers all across the United States with Yosemite related news released by this commercial entity in the park. Some of those same pictures were reused by Adams. So here, the picture that's on the upper right in the newspaper is reused to create a, a postcard. This is a real photograph postcard that Adams made for sale, probably in Best's Studios, which you may know now as the Ansel Adams Gallery in Yosemite. So Adams was creating all kinds of products, photographic products, to be sold at best, again, as souvenirs for people visiting the valley. And these real photo postcards are actual Ansel Adams gelatin silver prints that also can be found still on eBay for a relatively reasonable amount of money. Those postcards I found so charming and such an interesting way to think about Adams's commercial practice that we decided to use one for the cover of the book. And I'm really pleased with the way that it both speaks of Adams's Yosemite work, but looks somewhat different from what people may expect of Adams. Uh, and so what's, what's important here is that through Adams's work with the marketing department, he moves away from that much more subtle, low contrast style to something that fits with the YPCCO's marketing department goals, which is to create photographs that feature clear uh, actions in a very beautiful dramatic setting. But the idea that the message needed to be clear and clearly conveyed through the photograph is one that Adam spent almost eight years recreating through his work with the YPCCO. He finishes with them in 37, 38, breaks his contract with them and moves on to do other work. But I think that those lessons of working with the Yosemite Park and Curry Company and creating photographs that have marketing potential through their message influenced Adams's mature work in really significant ways. And I should just say, I'm moving very quickly here through a, a book that has lots more evidence and detail. So I encourage you, you can either ask questions after we're done here, but if you are interested in these uh, arguments that I'm making, there's a lot more detail in the book itself. So after Adams finishes with the YPCCO, one of the critical things that happens is that he is hired by the, um, Department of Interior to make photographs for the National Park Service parks to be hung in the new Department of Interior building. And among the photographs that he makes as part of that project is this one that we talked about earlier. So now I wanna take an ever so brief detour. I promise I'll keep it to just a couple of minutes to talk about Adams as an advocate for the medium of photography. I think as one of the most collected photographers by museums and private individuals, and one of the photographers whose prints have netted record prices in photograph sales, people can get a mistaken sense that Adams was um, part of an elitist photographic group. 
but that doesn't accurately describe who Adams was. He was really interested in making photography available to as wide an audience as possible. So part of that was institution building. He helped to found the Department of Photography at the Museum of Modern Art in 1940. Here's the bulletin that announces that. And you can see, maybe you can see where it says Committee on Photography right in the middle of your screen. Adams is listed as the vice chairman along with David McAlpin for creating this new uh, photography department. Also, you may know that he helped to found Friends of Photography, the organization that did lectures and showed exhibitions um, and did workshops in, based in Carmel starting in 1967. Adams also taught, he wrote technical manuals, but this is a picture from the Detroit Miniature Camera Club in 1941, where he went and gave a weekend workshop. It's significant because both Harry Callahan and Todd Webb were participants in this workshop and found Adams's instruction so inspirational that they moved from making amateur hobby photographs into serious photographic production. And then, of course, Adams had his own series of workshops, the Ansel Adams workshops, that began in 1940. These are two pictures from the 1977 workshop. But Adams's workshops were not about creating replicas of Ansel Adams. He wasn't trying to just produce landscape photographers who all use the zone system. He invited other teachers to work with him at these workshops, including Edward Weston, Dorothea Lang, Jerry Yulesman, Minor White. Um, I have a whole list of them here. Um, Roy D. Carava, Robert Heineken, Arnold Newman, Yosef Karsh. And he was trying to introduce people who were interested to the potential of artistic photography and also to provide them access to the technical skills that they maybe couldn't get on their own. Um, this is another picture from 1983 of some of the instructors that year. This is Olivia Parker, Arthur Ullman, Ansel Adams, and Roy DiCarava. So Adams was really thinking about how everyone could access photography and you know, you could be a mailman and go to the Ansel Adams workshop. You didn't need any particular credentials. And then, of course, Ansel Adams helped to co-found the Center for Creative Photography, where I work in Tucson. This is our building on the campus of the University of Arizona. And when Adams founded the CCP, this is a view from our archive, there was not another institution in the US actively collecting photographic archives. So it was a real way to undergird our field and make sure that the things that had happened in the 20th century were preserved in a location where people could access them in order to do future research. And so he was thinking about how to make sure that these materials remained accessible and that they were even preserved at all, because if there's no one collecting them, then maybe things just go in the dumpster, which sometimes they do. And so he was not trying to create a museum of Ansel Adams with the CCP, but rather an institution for the field, a, a kind of hallowed ground for photography, like he'd felt when he visited Alfred Stieglitz in 1933 at an American place. So that's my quick detour. And then finally, I'm going to read one short passage from the book about Moonrise. Um, and this fits with my discussion of Adams's mature work, the kind of style that we associate with his iconic production. So you have the right papers. All right. By far, Adams's most famous photograph is Moonrise Hernandez, New Mexico. Oft told, the story of its making is one of photographic legend. The creation of the Moonrise Negative happened on a trip when he was accompanied by his son, Michael, and his friend, Cedric Wright. And that's what we're looking at here. It's Adams to the right, Cedric Wright in the middle, and Michael Adams on the left. And in this year, he was eight years old. And this is them packing the car in Yosemite before they're about to leave on their trip all around the American West. They had been making photographs without much success in the Chama River Valley near Georgia O'Keeffe's Ghost Ranch in Northern New Mexico. 
Driving back to Santa Fe, Adams hastily responded to what he saw before him, quote, in the east, the moon was rising over distant clouds and snow peaks, and in the west, the late afternoon sun glanced over a south flowing cloud bank and blazed a brilliant white upon the crosses in the church cemetery, end quote. With the sun setting, he knew he had to act fast. Swerving his station wagon to the side of the road, he commanded his son and Wright to help him set up his eight by 10 inch view camera. Tripod, camera body, lens board, lens, dark cloth, loaded film holder, and light meter had to be pulled out and assembled before he could frame and focus the view, made all the more urgent by the rapid descent of the November sun. In the frantic hustle, the light meter could not be found. Evaluating the scene before him, Adams miraculously remembered the luminance of the full moon, 250 candles per square foot, and was able to approximate an exposure for the scene. He released the shutter and captured the clouds, moon, and mountains beyond the little town of Hernandez. Before he could make a second backup negative, the sun dipped below the horizon and the opportunity was gone. With that single negative, Adams preserved a view that has become a photographic icon. The image at its core exhibits many of his mature stylistic elements. Adams filled the frame with a vast expanse of sky, the moon hovering above a bank of horizontally striated clouds and a long low chain of mountains. He placed the chapel and cross-filled graveyard of Hernandez in the middle ground, bounded by a shrub-filled plain. The picture features a panoramic sweep of landscape and compellingly asserts that this perspective with its pr precise arrangement of human edifice within a monumental and impressive environment is the critical viewpoint for observing the scene. The drama comes in part from the relative scale of the elements. The endless quality of the sky reminds viewers how small and seemingly insignificant we are in the expanse of the universe. All of these visual qualities serve to inspire in the viewer a sense of awe in the face of a spectacular and unique visual experience, an appreciation for the natural scene and a feeling of amazement. Unlike the mountain pictures of the late 1920s and 1930s found in his Parmelian Prince portfolio or his Sierra Club album, Moonrise clearly conveys Adams's intensity of experience his message about the transcendental possibilities for people when they are immersed in nature and his deep appreciation for the American landscape. This slide compares his final print to his proof print. The proof print is a straight or unaltered printing from the negative with no darkroom work, such as dodging or burning, that allows the manipulation of exposure to select areas of a print. As such, it affords a view of Hernandez that is much closer to the one Adams originally observed, albeit in black and white. From this view of the landscape, he envisioned, or to use his parlance, visualized, the finished artwork of Moonrise Hernandez, New Mexico. Moonrise existed only in his imagination. He photographed a raw scene that he could transform in the darkroom into a symbol that would convey how he felt under a vast and beautiful New Mexico sky. By altering the relationship of the sky and the graveyard of, Hern of the Hernandez Chapel to create a dark expanse over a shimmering village burial ground, Adams created from the raw material of the landscape an emotionally engaging image, one that borders on magic or mysticism. On that November day, Adams drew on more than two decades of wilderness exploration and photographic experience to create what would become his masterpiece. Deep and repeated contemplation had etched in him the value and meaning of immersing oneself in nature. Equally ingrained were lessons about making photographs that effectively convey an essential idea. Adams's early years had readied him for the scene he discovered along the highway as the sun set over Northern New Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. Ben. So I think, 
You're welcome. I was just going to say, I think Scott's coming back for questions. Yeah, I am. Just give me a second. <clears throat> Thank you. That was really great. Um, I'll admit that's the first uh, talk of yours that I've been able to watch start to finish. Um, I started to watch some pre-recorded ones at many, many months ago when the book first came out. And, um, you know, it, it's easy to get distracted when it's not live and you can't ask questions and you're not a part of it. And I think that's probably why the, um, the book talks have continued to be so popular because it's, it's you know, a very important and endearing subject to a lot of, um, a lot of Americans for, for good reasons. Um, I wanna encourage people to uh, submit questions in the Q and A box. Um, the chat also works for questions. It's a little bit easier for us um, to, uh, to read them in the Q and A, but that's fine. Um, you know, either way works. And I wanted to, uh, or I'll start with, with one of the questions that we have here, which is did Ansel continue to make snapshots, not 35 millimeter black and white works of colleagues like Georgia O'Keeffe, but true snapshots? And I, I assume, I take that to mean, you know, color pictures of his wife, Virginia, or <laughs> whatever. Yeah, that's such a good question. I don't know if I know the answer to that question. Um, it, so my familiarity with Adams is primarily through archival collections. And I suspect that those snapshots are still with the family. So I have to believe that yes, when he went on family vacation, which I'm not sure he actually did that often, but, or, you know, was with his family in Yosemite or in Carmel that they took pictures. Um, but I don't, I don't think that we have those. The, that childhood album, <clears throat> I think um, Adams appreciated was significant to understanding his career. And I think that's why we have them. Um, but I suspect that his, his, let's call them his vernacular pictures, his family snapshots are still with his children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting, an, an interesting idea knowing that he started as a snapshot photographer, but, you know, of course, became a professional and a, a revered artist. Um, another question here uh, says that your questions about Adams's work and the evolution of it touch on numerous ways that photography presents images that quote unquote surpass reality. Um, has our role as photographers, poets, and artists to present images that quote surpass reality remained as it once was, or has it evolved? Um, so, so I'm gonna, I will get to that question, but I do wanna say that I think one of the interesting things that happened with Adams's style, which was designed to surpass reality as the questioner comments, over time began to take on a certain amount of uh, veracity that we now associate with that style of landscape photography, such that, um, again, over time, we came to think of that zone system, uh, panoramic perspective, omniscient viewpoint as like the postcard view, right? The way that you might document a scene to indicate that it existed in the world, but that it's, but that it's sort of bumped up. And, but, but it actually came to mean as much that it was rooted in the real world as it meant that it was bumped up. And so I think that's a kind of interesting evolution of Adams's own attempt at surpassing reality and the way that that style took on connotations of veracity or truth or realism over a period of many decades. Um, I mean, I actually think that there is a way to say that artists, that there is a common thread, that um, what Adams was trying to do with his pictures was to reveal to people something <clears throat> interior to him 
and that he wanted to create a visible work of art that conveyed that interior state out to, um, out to a public. And, uh, you know, when I think of an artist's task, whether it's a poet or a movie maker or a, a photographer or a painter, you know, there is that attempt to use the medium to reveal some, whether it's personal experience or universal truth or um, perspective that's otherwise obscured through that work of art. Um, I would say that the techniques, of course, have evolved and multiplied and um, that there are so many more um, styles and languages and modes available to artists now. And that's what makes it so rich for us now to, to be able to experience all of this artistic production. But I do think that there's maybe a common thread it's a really interesting question. Yeah. I hope that's indicative of where we're headed over the next several days <laughs> with this medium summit. Because if so, we've got good juicy stuff ahead. Sure. Um, another question, what was Ansel's relationship with Stieglitz O'Keefe and some of the uh, folks at 291 in New York, if there was a relationship at all? Yeah, so when Adams was uh, 31 and his wife Virginia was pregnant with their first child, Michael, uh, Adams's dad said, if you don't go to New York City right now, when you when while Virginia's pregnant and you don't have a baby at home, you're not, it's never going to be easier than it is right now. So uh, Ansel and Virginia travel to New York, and he writes about this in his autobiography that he went into Stieglitz's gallery at that point, it's an American place with his portfolio. And Stieglitz is distracted or busy and, and tells Adams to come back later. And Adams was very, you know, his ego was bruised and he told Virginia he didn't want to go back. And she was like, you are going back. And I mean, fortunately, Adams did go back. And when Stieglitz had time to really pay attention, he looked through his portfolio and was very impressed with Adams's work. He ultimately gives Adams a show at an American place, which Adams counted among the most significant experiences of his life. And people in the field, I think, still consider the prints he made for that show among some of the most exquisite photographs that Adams ever printed, just small, uh, prints for that show. Um, Adams continued his relationship with Stieglitz and he, I mean, he had tremendous respect uh, for Stieglitz. He really, he saw in Stieglitz the, the kind of uber advocate for photography and Adams wanted to do that himself on the West Coast. He actually came back and opened a commercial gallery after visiting Stieglitz. It was very short-lived and I think probably better for the world that Adams didn't become a gallerist and instead made pictures and did all these other things. Um, but that notion of a hallowed ground for photography, a place where the photographic medium was taken seriously, where the production of photographers was treated as an art form, deeply impacted Adams. And that was something that he kept searching for and trying to recreate in his various uh, endeavors. Um, he met O'Keefe in New Mexico, not with Stieglitz. I think that's right. I think he first met, meets O'Keefe in, in New Mexico and she's there with Rebecca Strand. Um, O'Keefe was just enough older than Adams and uh, more established as an artist than he was when they met that I get the sense that she always thought that he was um, like a very sweet, young, enthusiastic photographer, but like kind of a little junior, you know, like a kind of young puppy dog of a man. Um, but they remained friends throughout their entire lives. Although I think that dynamic of her being the like more mature established person stayed throughout their relationship. Um, Adams knew Strand. Um, and I mean, again, the field was so small in those early years that they were all communicating and corresponding. They, you know, Adams and Weston were very close. Adams and Lang were very close. Adams and Imogen Cunningham were very close. Uh, I mean, it was just a very tight knit community 
even distributed across the United States. So, and Adams was a real extrovert. He was a very social person. He loved his colleagues and um, really wanted to build a sense of community in the field. We have a we have a lot of questions or a lot of good ones. So I'm trying to filter through these okay. and, and you know pick as many as we can and keep keep on a good time frame. Um, can you say a few words about Ansel's work in Manzanar? It is so relevant to the current migration activities of the government. There are some classics, um, let's see, uh, like Mount Manzanar, or I think it's Mount Williamson perhaps, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but some very specifically photojournalistic images. So saying a few words about Manzanar is really the question. Yes, so, um, so Adams got permission to photograph at the Manzanar internment camp in Eastern uh, California um, because he was horrified that his neighbors, Japanese American citizens were being imprisoned and held against their will by the US government. Um, he felt that a photographic project that documented the the prisoners at Manzanar would demonstrate to other Americans that these people that he knew, his neighbors in San Francisco, um, were upstanding patriotic Americans and that, that it was wrong for them to be imprisoned the way they were. So, so he got permission and he made quite a large series of pr primarily portraits of the internees at Manzanar. The Mount Williamson portrait or uh, landscape picture is a, is a little tricky. And um, I think Adams has received some criticism because part of what he said during this period of time was at least these people were being imprisoned in a place of great natural beauty. Now, it was a desert, it was very dry. In the winter, it was extremely cold. And so I think for Adams, who was free, um, it was all well and good to find it a beautiful landscape. I'm not sure that if you're being held there against your will, that it feels, that feels like much of a consolation. But he did make that picture of Mount Williamson just outside the Manzanar internment camp. Um, and that is one of his iconic landscape pictures. Um, but I, I think it's a really important project and one that people don't know very well. I think it does still need to be seen um, through a lens of its time. Adams had this notion that if he could just show how good the people being imprisoned were that, that sentiment would warm, um, which I think was naive and, and in the end, not actually how it worked. Um, and it also meant that he didn't really show the hardships that, that the people who were interned there were suffering from. So I think there are criticisms to be levied, but I think it's nonetheless a really interesting body of work. Mm -hmm. There's a great comment here that I wanna share. It says, is it just me or does anybody else have the same visceral reaction to seeing Moonrise in person as a large print, as I did when I saw the statue of David in Florence. Mm -hmm. um, it brings tears to my eyes every time, which I thought was really great. Um, another question here, I'm curious to know how Ansel Adams felt about the presence of Native Americans in the park and how his well-crafted narrative techniques and those of his employers perpetuated the misconception that this land was unpopulated and how that narrative permitted the first people's uh, ult ultimate final displacement. Is this a subject he ever addressed in his work or his lifetime? So uh, this is a really good question and I think it's an important subject to, to think about. Um, so Adams was aware on that very first trip as a 14 year old, there were Indians um, present in Yosemite Valley. Um, the park service has always maintained a very kind of minimal acknowledgement of American Indian presence in the valley. Um, I'm sure that those didactics have changed and changed and changed over the many, I mean, over a hundred years now um, that it's been a park. But Adams photographed uh, American Indian people on that very first trip. I think that in part, knowing how um, decimated the population of Indians was that originally occupied that land um, and how 
displaced they were actually meant that his experience in northern New Mexico was all the more profound because he came from California where the Indians had been routed from their homeland and got to northern New Mexico and saw Pueblo Indians still living on their ancestral lands in their own habitation. And so I think that had a really um, profound impact and part that was part of what attracted him to photographing the Pueblos because he and he photographed Indian dances. This was a really novel experience compared to what he had, let's say, grown up with in the Yosemite Valley area. His, his introduction to Yosemite was through James Hutchings book, which is about the discovery of Yosemite by white people. And so Adams knew very well the kind of brutality, but it had been told from the discoverer's perspective. And again, I'm using air quotes, discoverer's perspective. So he knew the history very well. Um, I, don't, I don't know that there's any explicit commentary from Adams about that. I don't know that he ever reflected on it. I was really hoping that in the Mary Austin Ansel Adams correspondence, Adams was gonna talk about how he felt about either the Taos Pueblo people or about the California Indians he'd encountered as a child because Adams it was such a prolific letter writer that I sort of tongue in cheek feel like if he thought it, he wrote it down to somebody. So usually if you hypothesize that he said a thing or thought a thing, if you're persistent enough, you can find it in a letter somewhere. Mm -hmm. But here's Adams writing to Mary Austin, who's an Indian activist and they're working on a project about American Indians. Adams never once talks about how he relates to or thinks of or experiences the people that he works with at Taos. So he's pretty silent, at least through that late 20s period in articulating his, his thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wanna to add to that personally, when I read that part of your book, that was really interesting to me because it, it had been glossed over always as this Mary Austin, Ansel Adams kind of collaboration, the Taos Pueblo book. And I have never seen a copy of that book myself, but um, because I know it's rare, but, uh, but yeah, your book really illuminated that and sort of shed in, in, an intelligent dialogue on sort of Ansel's relationship to, to working with the people of Taos Pueblo, which I really, really appreciated. So um, we are just about at an hour um, because we got a little bit of a late start. Uh, another question I wanna, ask here is, um, did you interview people who may have known Ansel intimately or is your research mostly from archived materials and notes? That's a great question and I'll be brief since I know we're, we're at an hour. Um, both, I did both. So I've spoken to all of Adams's darkroom assistants um, and have relationships with them all. I'm close to both of Adams's children. Um, I've, I've worked with various members of his uh, staff from the 1970s who've stayed in the field. Um, so that was a component, but one of the things, and this is um, in the book, is that Adams really steered people away from looking at his early decades. I think he felt it was very disconnected from his mature work and he, as the artist himself, didn't see much relevance to his early work on understanding his later work, which of course is his prerogative as the artist. Um, but that belief meant that the people that he worked with tended to focus on later work and didn't really research the earlier work. So that felt like a real opportunity to me. And the advantage of there being such a rich archival record is that I, I have been able to compare what he said about the early work and sort of truth test it against what he wrote at that moment or what the pictures look like at the moment or what he was doing at the moment. So the archival record allowed me to circumvent, circumnavigate what people say or what they remember or how they felt at the end of Adams's life and go to what actually happened. And so that discovery process as a historian is an incredible pleasure, but it also meant I have a, a a sense of Adams as a young man that many of the people who knew him as an older man, it's a very different relationship. Hmm. That's great. 
Um, well, I want to go ahead and wrap up because we we've, we've hit an hour, and I want to keep everybody's endurance and momentum there because I think that's always the kind of comfortable place to end. Um, before uh, before we go, I want to remind everybody that we have another talk tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And that's with a remarkable vernacular photography collection that was acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Uh, so that making sure my mental calendar is right is Thursday at 4 p.m. Um, and you can register for that on the Medium Photo website. It's free as well. Um, and I also just uh, wanted to encourage everybody to pick up a copy of Becky's book. Um, I, before the pandemic happened or right around the same time, my wife and I ordered a copy of it and, you know, I quickly devoured it. I kind of took it away from her and put it on my side of the bed. Um, but it really became a, a, just a remarkable bedtime read every night. It was like the, the perfect way for me to kind of recharge and just think about, um, you know, somebody else's life and the development of their career. And I thought it was just such a great book. Um, so I want to say thank you to you, Becky. And also thank you very much for the talk today and for everybody here being part of it and submitting questions that we were able to get to. Um, so I'm grateful. Thank you. Well, thanks, Scott. I, and thanks for the endorsement. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah. Thanks so much. See you soon. <laughs>